T-shirts alone got us maybe our first 10 customers. And then the 11th customer started to ask for something else. And that's when we decided, okay, we'll try it out. In 2010, Salty Customs started off as a customized T-shirt business. It went from like the first order, I think maybe it was like 50 pieces, 300 pieces. Today, after 14 years in business, they've evolved from just being an apparel consultancy. But then we got a phone call, and this phone call was for 10,000 pieces. Initially, I thought it was a prank call. They're now a merchandise solution business with expertise in design, tech, manufacturing, and global fulfillment. Say we were doing 10 million per annum, but we were losing net about a million. So that means our burn was about 11 mil. Some of the 1,500 international brands they serve include people like Facebook, Grab, Coca-Cola, Nescafe, Formula One, and Universal Music. That's where you really find out that, oh, actually nobody can help you, you're on your own. So it's either that or bankruptcy. So what is Salty Customs really? And how did it all begin? The last one when we started the business is just really supply and demand, right? So people demanded for certain things and we supplied it to them. And in our case, it was a team of people that could just one-stop solution mm -hmm. in high-quality products, especially in apparel, with design services and ultimately a reliable team that can deliver on time because usually apparel products are used for a particular event. You miss that window, then you don't need the shirts already. Salty Customs grew really fast, but it wasn't always smooth sailing. Along the way, I think we had a few things done right. We positioned ourselves as the brand for brands, and then we grew. I think entrepreneurship is a journey of self-discovery, right? I have to understand who I am as I go along. At some point, King was able to hire some of the best people around, but wasn't able to fully utilize their talents. I just decided that, oh, we needed to hire more experts. So we gotten like these people from consulting firms, or we got people from uh, advertising agencies to join us. But then I was not able to manage the team well enough at that point. In short, I failed. I got the best people, but I didn't know how to use them. It was like a boat paddling, but not in sync. Then I had to stop all of that reorganize the whole thing. I'm simplifying it, but it's like a 15-year journey. We still have an office in, in Singapore right now, and that was started nine years ago. The Malaysian office is 15 years old. In between, we went to Australia as well. We had some affiliates. We had like 40 people in all these countries. Now we're down to 12. We have five core members, and we've got a few really reliable people that we source out work to. We're all trying to build this brand again. So let's go back to the beginning. T-Shirts was able to get Saudi Customs their first few customers. But how did they market the business? How did they scale? T-shirts alone got us maybe our first 10 customers. And then the 11th customer started to ask for something else, like maybe a polo shirt or a dress shirt. And that's when we decided, okay, we'll try it out. And so we expanded our product offering to polo and T-shirts and button-down dress shirts. So the whole shirt journey took us quite far. I think it was a good six, seven years. So it went from like the first order, I think maybe it was like 50 pieces, 300 pieces. We went on BFM, great, great exposure. Thank the BFM team as well. They wanted to showcase the businesses in Malaysia and what they can do. But then we got a phone call and this phone call was for 10,000 pieces. Initially, I thought it was a prank call and it turns out it's for a huge uh, sporting event. The moment we started doing that one, we delivered our first batch, started to take notice of us and they started to ask us to do more things. So today, we don't only produce t-shirts. We are a team of experts that source, design, and deliver for you. Companies who have regional presence will find us very useful. We handle it all. We clear customs issues, we take care of your logistical planning. Basically, the quality control and time framing of every single thing. And then we just get it done and make sure that it's there on that time. At this point, you might think T-shirts. Hmm, there are many companies who can also print T-shirts. What makes Sorted Customs different? The fact that you're oblivious to the competition and how dense the market is, is very useful because you know that you have a product and service that is useful and you just go ahead and create the best version of it. So for us at that time was that even though there were so many players in the market, we didn't know who they were. So that's obliviousness, right? Just naivety and it's good. We just wanted to bring that level to our own standard. Making shirts shouldn't be so difficult because at that point it was like, 
how do you even do it? Everybody has minimum order quantities. They've got a whole list of invisible criteria that you don't even know of. So we just wanted to make it more transparent and easier to do it. You just set a bar so high for yourself, you just go for it. Don't care about who is in the market. What made us different from them, from what we hear from our clients is that some companies that can really make uh, print clothing or shirts cannot do design. Whereas the ones that can do design cannot actually make good quality shirts. And the ones that can do both usually cannot get the brief. One of the key things that we do, uh, or I believe in, in, in sales, is instead of hard selling to them, we help the customers buy. Because every competitor is like, okay, what do you want? I'm gonna print this up. Okay, give me design, I print for you. What size? I bring it for you, right? So ours was different. I was like, I'm trying to understand your objective, what do you need this for, and then let's work towards there together. So there was a way that we did it, right? It's called the Salty Customs way. The basis of it is help people buy. You and I are on the same team. If you walk out today not buying anything from me, it's okay. But did you get your objective sorted or not? If not, can I help you get the objective sorted? Can I introduce you to somebody in the market that can solve your problems? Because entrepreneurship for me is solving a real problem. So the word of mouth started to spread, people saw value, and that was how we grew. It is said that all businesses exist to solve problems. So what is the real problem that Saudi Customs solve? Obviously, we would transition to where we are today because customers, when they buy something from you, it initially starts with product, right? Again, like I said, supply and demand, but that's only initial. After that, what happens is a transaction of trust takes place. So when somebody trusts you and, oh, these guys, right, they can get things done, one. When they have a pain, they will come to you first and say, actually, can you help me also with? And that's when opportunities happen. Getting a new customer is usually the hardest part, but retaining a customer, I mean, a customer is 50% more likely to buy from you again if they already trust you, if a transaction of trust has taken place. That's basically what happened for us. We had certain clients who trusted us and wanted us to try to produce more things. We trust you, can you please you know, go and sort this out? That was when evolution started to happen. From a production standpoint, we started to ask ourselves, how can we source for more items that we ourselves believe in? So we had to believe in a few things, aesthetics, quality, durability of the item. And finally, what we did was we made sure that we could get it at a good price. So it started with electronical items like a wireless Bluetooth headphones, right? Gym bags, tote bags, notebooks, and we just expanded all the way to windbreakers, coats, hoodies, jackets. In the beginning, King did all the designs himself together with his small team. We split the work. I will do sales and marketing. Then Adam will help with design, overlooked by my partner at the time. And then had one person who helped with operations and administrative. And that's it. We just went that way. People always ask how much is startup capital. The startup capital was how much money we had in the bank. I had nothing more than 2,000 ringgit, I think. Quite poor. The point is, we didn't really use a lot of money. We had some money. This is what I believe in the most. When you want to start something, you make sure you have a solid product that solves a problem. And then you start issuing this thing called quotation. Find someone who is interested in your product, you give them a quotation. We issued out three quotations, two people paid in full. We used the money to buy the stocks, make the products, deliver the items. Then we just rinse and repeat that process over and over again. And that was how we started the company. One of King's advice to growing Sorted Customs is don't overcomplicate business. I personally had this feeling before, which was pointed out by my wife. She said that the only person who is complicating the process is you. That hit me like a brick wall. It's like, oh yeah, okay, that's true. So as we become more learned and more sophisticated, or when we have more money, or we listen to more people talk, we kind of forget, we tend to forget what is the essence of it all. It's a trade of service, right? I get paid for solving your problem. How do I get paid? You need to have a quotation. Lah. Then only people can pay you. Ma. That was how we started. And I think the only person that complicates the, the situation is yourself. So there's nothing wrong with anybody. Some people might be complicating the, the situation for themselves right now, but be careful. You may make it first and then you start to complicate the situation for yourself later. Then you'll find yourself in a bigger mess, uh, which was what happened for us. So starting out as a business, how did Sorted Custom get their first customer? And is that strategy still valid today? With all the spam blockers and phone revealers, people are not going to pick up calls that they don't no. know who you are. Yeah. Chances are that they will not. So I don't think this would be the most effective manner, but I, I wouldn't write it off completely. There are people like me still, because I guess if you come from mm. a cold calling background or whatnot, yeah. you, you tend to give people a chance. 
And, and before I started my own business, I worked for someone else and they also forced me to find clients and that was how I did it. Someone else gave me the benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. But I also understand that we live in a different generation now and some people are like, don't call me man, if you don't know me, don't call me. The ways to reach people is so diverse and we just gotta evolve with the times. But don't write it off, I'll never write anything off. As King begins serving more and more customers, he also listened to his customers. That's important. And that's how they grew from just offering t-shirts to offering a full-blown merchandise range and becoming a merchandise solutions business. So again, I think we got lucky on that one. Each project is sizable. There are six-figure projects that we do. When business is done right, referrals can be the best customer acquisition source. Every time our client leaves to go to another company, they'll take us with them. They will have friends in this, doing the same thing. They will introduce, hey, these guys can get things done. They help me, you know, save me like a month of sleep. They were the reasons why I got promoted. That is very helpful for us. And we just keep, you know, going to the next client because of the word of mouth. And one of the biggest challenges for entrepreneurs, including King, is that at some point, you'll be left alone to fend for yourself. You will inevitably be left completely alone to face some of these biggest challenge. So the company was growing and making money, but the revenue growth did not reflect the net profit growth. Say we were doing 10 million per annum, but we were losing net about a million. So that means our burn was about 11 mil. If you're not savvy with all the functions of your business, and that was me at the time, I had no idea that as we were making money, we were bleeding out even more. And so suddenly you find yourself in the position where, oh, you need a million ringgit. Despite feeling like you've won for an, whole, for an entire year, not coming from a, from a wealthy family or, or from a background that I could just get a million ringgit, you know, that becomes a real problem. You start to look around at your teammates for help. That's where you really find out that, oh, actually nobody can help you, you're on your own. So it's either that or bankruptcy. So I thank God that we are still here. We had good people. As a matter of fact, I never had an experience or encounter with a bad person in my team. Everybody had good intentions. It's just in different seasons, different times, they didn't, just didn't know how to help. If you're not strict with your budget, you tend to overspend every month in the name of reinvestment. Uh, you only need a few bad months to really feel the, the, the hit. So for us, it was just really like we were doing well and so we wanted to keep expanding. And the expansion did not follow a budget. Hey, well. Yeah, let's just do it. You know, it's fine. The money will come back, you know. Yeah. Well, money will come back. And then, hey, the money didn't come back for one month, two months, three months. All your profits are gone. Fourth month, fifth month is lost already. Okay. We had so many people at the time, it didn't have to take us many months to achieve that kind of burn. <laughs> yeah, it was like two months and we're there. And also, I think this was the moment I realized that, hey, your business model and your acumen all is different, you know. Like, you have good business acumen, you can talk, you can close deals, you can give people the good feeling and, and, and be reliable and all that. You can under-promise, over-deliver, but actually your strategy sucks, you still die because your ambition and your ability cannot match. And the King's strategy to scaling solid customs to an 18.4 million business, hire more front-end facing people doing sales who can also transition to the back end when help is needed. I always have the philosophy that if you have enough front facing people, if they can hunt and bring in the sales, they can actually do the production work also. They can actually do the processing. Okay. But if you have back end heavy, means processing heavy people, they cannot do the sales. So I had like um, maybe about close 12 people or 16 people just in the front. In ratio, I think maybe we have five people in the back rather than 16 at the back and five in front because it's always better to have sales first. You know, you can bring them back and say, okay, stop doing so much sales, come back, help to produce and then go back out and do sales again right. rather than the other way around. And the expansion to Singapore was a good move for us because once we employed the same kind of uh, philosophy in, in, in Singapore and built a team there, the market there is sophisticated enough to appreciate uh, what we're trying to do. So what is Sorted Customs today? In fact, they're more than just a merchandise company offering unique solutions for unique problems. Let's just say a couple of years ago, maybe right before the pandemic. We realized that uh, the trend is changing. Customers not only, they don't only need you to produce merchandise. Number one, efficiency. So if you are ever in a company, if you are a procurement director or a marketing director for a company and you have 10,000 employees to serve, designing, producing and receiving the merchandise is only one part of the headache. Apportioning and then ultimately distributing it to different people who are now working hybrid from home and different countries is another major headache. So we recognize that there is this disconnect and so we went in and solved the problem. Number two, distribution. So the first thing we did was we focused on something called online to offline. When our customers needed to offer 
their merchandise or swag to their own partners and staff. They need a platform for that. So it would be a lot simpler if they had a link to a website and you could just send it to your whole team of 10,000 people. They log on, they select what they want, they key in their details and their address and everything. The items are being shipped directly to them. So then you as a procurement director or marketing manager, you don't have to worry about the distribution. We recognize that there is this need. So we offered this service to them and said, why don't I design the page for you so you don't have to collect sizes with the Excel sheet. So they say, yeah, okay, sure. So a few of our clients were like, yeah, okay, fantastic, this is great. You know, we'll pay you for it, just get it done. So we built a site, uh, we designed the items. Some of them wanted to allow the staff to claim the items for free, which means the company will pay. So then there is some technical adjustments here and then, okay, we said we'll do it, we'll give you a code. This code is equivalent to money, you send it to everybody, then they will key in the code and they redeem their items, so to speak. And this was when we went on online to offline. So if you look at us 10 years ago and 10 years today, we're doing the same thing, we're solving people's problems in, in the whole merchandise coordination spectrum uh, without them having to feel the fear or concern about quality or delivery. It's the same thing. And number three, merchandising and monetization. After that, we, we saw some clients who needed to create a new revenue stream. And this was interesting to us because they said, hey, you know what? Um, I want to sell my merchandise online, but I don't know how to build an e-store. I, I don't want to spend money to like worry about payment gateway, UI, UX and everything. Can you just get it done? So they just speak to us about what they want to sell. We we'll design the items for them, create an e-store for them, and then we put it out for sale. And when anybody buys their stuff, we will process everything and the profit will go back to them. That's how we evolved. So an e-store, in, in short, can be used for internal distribution of your merch or external as a separate revenue stream for your business. So what's the secret? How does King manage so many processes and services across Salty customers? This is where I come to believing that you never truly make it on your own. There are so many good people behind the scenes working alongside with us to make this happen. You know, in short, there's this saying internally, which is like, hey, let's bring joy to the people who receive the item. Because you know, imagine you receiving an item from your company or from your trusted brand. Yeah, yeah. You're very excited, right? That moment, like opening and all that. It's like, then, wow, it's a shirt or it's a bag or whatever, a phone case. We are responsible for that joy, that moment of joy that, that you have in that second, in that moment, in that instant, you see. So everybody's bought into that idea and we just play different parts to bring this into a reality. So what would you advise new entrepreneurs? You either don't do it or you just do it. <laughs> the sooner you find out who your authentic self is and the faster you can live it and you don't have to live like so many different versions or so many different masks and faces, the better. And then you apply that at home, you apply that at work and you apply that everywhere. Today, all brands appear to have a persona and face. Mark Zuckerberg, Elon Musk, Gary Vee. Is it better to build a personal brand or a company brand? And do all brands need a face? It's a fantastic uh, angle and tool when it reaches a certain level. Like say, for example, you want people to, like the critical mass to buy in. It's easier for them like, you know, to call you by one name rather than two names. Yeah. If you can build a business where the cause is bigger than the person, then people should resonate with the cause, not the person. I think it's what people want. They want to associate the company with someone, with a face. I don't think it's what you must do and to each their own. So maybe in this season right now, I am not going to split hairs with that. I'm just going to authentically do this. But there might come a time where I need to just front something. I just need to be the face of one thing. There might come a, come a time where I need to do that and I'll do that. But for now... And one of the really interesting things we asked King was, what would he do differently if he had to start all over again? What advice would he give himself then and now? Actually, I really loved the zeal that I had when I was starting out. You get married, you have kids, you mellow, your back hurts. <laughs> <laughs> and the zeal goes, goes when the back hurts, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'll keep the zeal of the 20-something and I will add in the um, maturity and wisdom of the 30-something. Be Think through what decisions you will make with partnerships. Think through investment decisions with your money. Never take a good time for granted. Always be ready for your next jump. Stay true to your authentic self. 
which by the way, if you're 20 something, you just wouldn't have it. My understanding of it at that time was very, very little. So if I look back at it today, oh, I thought I was very interested in X, but in reality, I was more interested in what's beneath X. You wouldn't know that because you were still young and figuring it out. And don't be too hard on yourself that it is what it is. Your personal brand, the brand that you're building is, is not the same. There are instances where certain, certain entrepreneurs would tie themselves to the thing that they're building. But I believe that I can be both. I can have a brand and my brand is perhaps I love fulfill fun. I love automation. I love anything that is in the realm of AI and robotics. Anything that's aesthetically pleasing and beautiful. That's my brand. Not all the businesses I run, not all the brands I own need to have the same built up and DNA, right? Mm. Perhaps they have the same values, but I can have a merchandise business that is more aesthetically driven. I can also have an AI business that is uh, driven by technology and uh, automation, but they're both mine. So in this case, um, I do have two brands. I have Salty Customs and I have Armtech. The brand that we are talking about today is Salty Customs lah. So you go to saltycustoms.com and the answer should be there and we're available on all uh, major social media. Uh, my LinkedIn is active. Find me King Kwa on LinkedIn and that's it. Now I hope you enjoyed this interview and I hope you subscribe. But what I really hope you do is to subscribe to the Daily Simo newsletter for content like this, interviews and marketing lessons sent straight to your inbox every single day. You can subscribe at blog.dailysimo.net and I hope to see you there.